it turns out that Chris is an alum of uh, mine. Uh, we went to the University of Maryland at College Park. Go! Go Turf, right? Yeah. Yeah. A great place. Chris has the distinction of being uh, one of the few guys who got to live in an all-male dorm. Um, it turned out okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he somehow found time to study, so he became um, a chemist and got a chemistry degree from the University of Maryland. And then he went on to work as a scientist. Was that the title? Close enough. All right, at a place called the Industrial Chemical Corporation of Baltimore. Now, is it Baltimore? No. Bomber. 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 All right, you can tell I'm a DC kid. Um, then he moved on to this place called DNR. It's, it's located nearby. And uh, he was running water quality monitoring programs in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, then he decided he wanted to uh, paddle around a bit more, and he ended up as the West Road Riverkeeper, as you all know, right? Everybody not know this, all right? Can you tell me something we don't know? I'm a all right, here we go. He's <laughs> there. We go. As we all know, he's he's he served two terms as a councilman. And by day, Chris has a real job, so he's only councilman for his part-time gig, right? Now, it's not bad. He is now director at the State and Environmental Initiatives uh, Division within the Hatcher Group here in Annapolis. So, what we're going to do, Chris is going to make a few, uh, a few comments and talk a bit, um, and then we'll open it up to a broad discussion base. So, hold your questions, so let Chris talk for at least two minutes. All right. <laughs> here we go, Chris. Thanks, Tom. All right, Scotty told me I had to stand in the light, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and obey instructions, which is not always my forte. Um, yeah, so I told Tom, I, look, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about some broad overview, but I mean, honestly, the fun here is you guys asking questions and me giving answers, and let's be honest, I got nothing to lose. I'm not running for anything, so I'm going to, I'll answer any questions, so whatever you got. Um, so broadly, I would say the association reached out to me a month or so ago and said, hey, we want you to come and talk about impact fees and development fees and, and how to fix things. And so um, I have a couple broad thoughts about that. But first, I want to kind of back up and look at the 10,000 foot level. And the reason that we need to regulate all of these things is to try and control pollution, right? And so in our county, especially recently with some of the big rain events, what we've seen is some very high profile sediment and erosion control issues with construction sites and other places where um, there's barren land or there's potential for erosion. And, um, you know, what, what we see, how that manifests itself is, you know, rivers of chocolate milk uh, going off of sites into our local waterways and believe me, every time that happens, I get emails and videos and pictures showing me that, which is great. So I want to first say thank you. Um, as, you as a representative of the county council, I depend on that. And what I do with those is I take those reports and I share them with our Department of Inspections and Permits. And I say, hey, guys, uh, did you know about this? Um, are you going to do anything about it? And for most part, they respond to me very quickly because they can't afford to ignore a county council member. Um, because budget season comes up every year. Um, so I hear some frustrations. A lot of uh, very active citizens say, well, I, I call inspections and permits, and I report these things, and I never hear back. And I would say, for the most part, I think the, the department is trying to do the best they can. But if you share them with me, I will make sure that they get followed up on, because they can't ignore me, like I said. Um, so recently, we, we had a couple of big events. You remember um, about a month ago, I think, there was a really giant rainstorm. It's one of these 100-year storms that happens every couple years now. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thank you, climate change. Um, and uh, so one particular site that we saw this um, was in Annapolis Roads. Anybody here from Annapolis Roads? Yeah, I figured that's a good table over there. Um, so there's a development happening there. Uh, some athletic complex is going in. And um, it was a pretty big site failure. Uh, I think and no one could come here and defend that that was not a failure. So I immediately reached out to the director and also uh, the head of the key school whose development is. And I said, you guys got to do something. And I will say to their credit, they met at the site the next day and they did put some additional things in place. Fast forward a few weeks, uh, there was another big rainstorm about a week ago. I get more emails and pictures and videos of sediment. So I, I reach out to the, to the inspections and permits. I was like, guys, I thought we fixed this. 
So it turns out that they discovered an old terracotta pipe from decades and decades ago that was associated with the golf course. It was not on any plans and no one knew about it. And that was serving to convey site, uh, sediment from the site, which was a little bit better uh, maintained than before, directly into the waterways. So now they know about that, they're going to fix it. But it's like you fix one thing and there's another. And why does it matter? We all see the murky brown sediment, but that sediment goes into the waterway. It eventually settles out. It's bad. It, it gets on oyster reefs and things like that. But really, the, danger, the more dangerous thing is what we don't see, which is the nutrient pollution that's associated with that. Okay, We're talking about nitrogen pollution and phosphorus pollution. That causes algae blooms. It gets the whole ecosystem out of whack. And that's what causes fish kills and makes our water quality um, bad in the summertime. You know how like anybody live in waterfront communities and you have community beaches and you take your kids down there and you swim like in May and June, it's great, right? The water's all clear. And then by August, it's kind of nasty, right? That's all algae growth and that's all things that have gone into the waterways and are manifesting itself. And so what, are, what do we have in place to try and prevent that? A couple things. Um, first, we have sediment and, and erosion control. This is... Um, uh, under the auspices of the county, there's state uh, permits and state regulations as well. But really, it's the county who does the, the bulk of the enforcement. Um, the problem until recently was our sediment and, ero and erosion control uh, regulations, which requires you know the sediment fencing and the construction entrance to be covered with rocks instead of dirt, and all of those things. Um, they were only designed to meet a one-inch rainstorm. A one inch rainstorm because the theory was well, that's a big storm, and anything above that doesn't happen very often, and there's nothing we can do about it. So let's just try and control, you know, for 95% of the rainstorms. Well, maybe that was great back in the 80s, but s since then, our climate is changing very rapidly, and we are getting bigger and more frequent large storm events. They're overwhelming that. So the good news is, uh, about a year ago, the county upgraded their regulations. So now they have to control to about a two and a half inch rainstorm. Um, and so any new construction that happens has to have sediment and erosion control measures in to capture and treat that much rain. That's good. Problem is anything that was approved before those measures are still under the one inch and, and we're getting our problems. The other thing that the county has um, is impact fees. These are development, developer impact fees that you pay for new construction. If you come in and you do uh, a new housing subdivision or even a single new home, you have to pay impact fees. And these uh, range, I got the, I'm not any good with numbers anymore because my brain is just fried. So I had to print these out. But um, folks that pay attention might remember a long time ago, back in 2009, we increased, the, the county increased the impact fees. So the current, uh, and they adjust every year now according to uh, an inflator, but the current um, level is for very small residential structures of 500 feet and below, it's a total of about $4,000 that you pay. And these go to roads and schools and public safety. Um, you get to your biggest development, 6,000 feet and over, it's $17,885. So I would say like your average, you know, 1,500, maybe 2,000 foot home, um, that's looking like about eleven or twelve thousand dollars in impact fees. What happens to that money? Well, it's divided up between schools and public safety and roads, and that has to be spent in those districts on improvements that are designed to accommodate the new capacity that those are bringing in. Um, are those fees high enough? Honest answer: No, not really. Um, the compromise was uh, most of these are like eighty percent of what the true cost is. Um, at that time, I think that those could certainly be revisited. Um, the other important uh, funding source, and I think folks in this room are very familiar with this because you helped me pass the bill uh, back early in my term, is the stormwater fee, stormwater program. Right. Um, this, is, this is what the haters call the rain tax. Maybe you've heard of that term. Uh, I refuse to use it because this is probably the most effective and, and cost-effective program in the entire state of Maryland where um, every residence and every commercial uh, building is paying a modest fee. That's going in to a dedicated fund. Every nickel of that is spent on improving water quality in the county. 
through projects and public outreach to reduce pollution. So every year uh, from that fee, we get about 21, maybe $22 million. We, we use that uh, through bonds to finance it to do even bigger projects. And we have dozens of projects going all over the county every year. And this is helping control flooding, it's helping to reduce pollution, and it's helping to stabilize a lot of our eroded stream banks that over time have become completely unstable and are just contributing more sediment every time it rains because it just erodes. So this is a great project. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have ever had Eric Michelson, who runs the program, come and talk to you. Uh, but he's an excellent ambassador, can tell you all about it. It's something I'm very proud of. You don't get a lot of elected officials to come and say, my number one accomplish was, accomplishment was uh, passing a new tax or a fee, but gosh darn it, that's what I did, and I'm damn proud of it. So. <laughs> And I, like, I like to say, look, you know, um, people shouldn't run away and hide from things the government needs to do. Like, we needed to do this, and we did it, and it, we took a hit, so we, I got beat up a little bit, you know. We're, we're raising taxes, we're raising fees, but you know what? We have the projects to show, and we have the water quality improvements to show. If anybody saw the new Chesapeake Bay report, the underwater grasses are coming back, our rivers are doing better, and that is in some part due to the local measures that we're doing and things all across the state that Maryland is doing. So, you know, actions work. Um, so, I mean, the other thing I guess I wanted to talk to you guys about is just citizen engagement. Um, the county does not have a band of roving in inspectors that go around looking for problems all the time. I mean, they have to inspect sites a certain uh, amount of time. It's not enough, but there's not enough staff, and they have to go around. But when there are problems, whether it's critical area violations or sediment erosion control, really what they're relying on is citizen reports. And um, that's why our river keepers are so valuable, because they are full-time advocates that are going out as a presence. But also, regular you know, Joe or Jane homeowner can make a call and actually activate an enforcement action. And so that's important, because one person can make a difference, and we need those eyes and ears everywhere. So I'd encourage you guys to get engaged. But what we have to do on the county end is doing a better job of enforcement. And then when those violations are identified, we have to be, do a better job of um, negatively impacting the violators, I would say, right? So we have to make the, the penalties enough to make them think twice about doing it instead of just the cost of business. Now, there's a great state bill that's under consideration right now. Uh, my friend De Delegate Lafferty has this. And um, Jesse Iliff, the South River Keeper, has been a big proponent of this. Um, and it would require um, counties to submit an annual report to the State Department of the Environment saying how many violations they identified and what happened with those violations. And I think that would go a long way to increase the accountability. What we have in our county, I think, is um, we have probably not enough staff to, to meet the need to go out and inspect the, all these and follow up on everything. But then even when they do, they get into the legal system and they get a very reduced fine or it gets waived for, you know, suspended and nothing really happens. And we really have to kick up the enforcement on that. So I wanted to say a word about that state bill. You guys should be proud of the South River Keeper uh, for his advocacy on that. It's something that I've also weighed in on uh, in my capacity as a council member. It's 1381, and it was passed by the House of Delegates, and it's currently in the Senate, so it has to be passed by the Senate, and then the governor would have to sign it. Um, and it, it got pretty good support in the House, so the Senate had their hearing today. Uh, seemed to go pretty well, so I'm pretty optimistic about that. Um, there's a couple other things I want to say, uh, just very briefly, then I'll open this up to questions, because you're probably bored of hearing me talk already. But um, there's, I think, a need, you've heard me reference this a couple times, to increase our enforcement staff. So I've put in a formal request to the county executive to hire some more inspectors in, in this budget, upcoming budget. They said that's under consideration. So to the extent that you guys want to come to budget hearings and make a case for anything, I would say, say that we need better enforcement and more staff in inspections and permits uh, to accommodate that. Um, thank you. The other thing, I, I have a couple of other really smart folks that I'm working with to try and figure out if there are specific things that we could legislate or work with the administration to put in place to reduce some of these uh, pollution issues with construction sites. 
And a couple things we're thinking about, in addition to increasing, you know, the amount of rainfall we have to treat, is uh, limit the amount of bare earth that's, av that's allowed to be on a site at one time. So instead of, instead of, <laughs> instead of coming in and moonscaping the place, like let's do it in phases so you can stabilize it, right? And then I think we also need to think about limiting the velocity that can come out of these outfall pipes. So, you know, if you've got a catchment area and then it gets to its capacity and it's just blowing out of some uh, pipe into the nearest stream, that's not, that's not doing any good. So I think we need to figure out a way to control that, put some thresholds on that. And numeric limits are something we can actually test and then hold people accountable for. So those are some things I'm looking into. I'm also working with um, City of Annapolis. You guys probably know Rob Savage is a good friend of mine, a new city alderman that's been elected, a uh, very strong environmentalist. And we're kind of collaborating on things he wants to do with the city, things I want to do with the county. And I think that can be a good thing. So with that, uh, I've talked to you guys enough. And let's get to the fun part. Let's take some questions, right? Right up front. We'll start with you, sir. I have next to a beautiful sod. Oh, wow. Is it legitimate to harvest it in November, leave it wide open all winter, with it running into Burley Creek? Um, is it legitimate? <laughs> uh, when I call the Department of Agriculture, yeah. he tells me, look at my front lawn. Do you see sand moving there? Right. Your driveway, that's all right. So I will say that, um, so when I was West Road Riverkeeper, I had a very uh, contentious relationship with the sod farms in, um, in, in my area there. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's an agriculture use, and they're guided by a lot of the agriculture code. And, and to a large extent, um, you know, they, they have they classified as the same thing as farm field runoff. Now, where, where you have an opportunity is when there's a conveyance of that runoff into a ditch or a pipe, then that becomes an actual Clean Water Act issue. So, I mean, best practices, I would tell you, is, you know, look, they got to harvest the sod at some point. Maybe they can phase it in. Should they do it in November? Maybe that's not best, but it's probably better than doing it in the spring when, you know, that's when the algae blooms are happening. So, um, absolutely, I would say yes. I think we should be limiting any polluted runoff. I mean, polluted runoff is causing our problem. Um, that probably would not fall under our stormwater, uh, urban stormwater permit, so it would probably be more under agriculture. But that's something that uh, I'd be interested in, in working more on or talking to some of the folks that, that specialize in, in that sort of runoff. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a large area, so there's a lot of sediment that can come off of that. And when they scalp it all, it's, I mean, I've seen it happen. It's, it's acres, and it, it goes into a ditch, and it goes into a stream, and it goes into a creek, which ends up in the river. We all do, yeah, we all do. Uh, Dick Lon in the back, I see you. I didn't recognize you without your bumblebee costume at first. That's not a question, that's a statement, Dick. <laughs> um, so growth, I would agree with you. Growth is the number one issue right now in campaign and Arundel world, um, and rightfully so. We're, we're doing our uh, general development plan. The GDP is coming up. 
Um, and I'll say that uh, eight years ago, I decided to run for office because of growth issues. I mean, we had the comprehensive rezoning coming up, and I decided that I didn't want other people making decisions about what our community was going to look like. I wanted to make those decisions. Um, and uh, so I think it's, it's a very ripe issue. How we grow, um, there's, there's always going to be, I mean, the, the problem with, with growth is it's a loaded word. So growth means different things to different people. I look at growth as change. Uh, there's always going to be change. Our county is going to change. Um, how it changes is where the action is. Now, I'm not anti-growth, but I am anti-dumb growth. Like, I don't think we, need, we should be putting giant subdivisions in areas where there's no services and people have to drive everywhere. That's, that's how things were done in the 50s. That's not how things are done now. Um, so I think where we should be concentrating is figuring out what are the future trends, what are all these millennials that are coming up, wh where are they going to want to live in 10 years, 20 years, and what sort of services are they going to want and need, what are our aging generation, you know, the boomers, where are they going to be and what are they going to need, and think about how to accommodate those. Think about things like what's going to happen in 10, 20 years if autonomous cars are the normal thing and no, you know, people just get in their car and they press a button. Does that mean that they don't care about how long they have to commute anymore because they can sit and read a book? I mean, these are legitimate growth questions that no one has the answer to. But I'll tell you one thing. I think that no matter what happens, I'm for places that are connected with bike and pedestrian infrastructure where people can get to services like um, grocery stores or retail or library or senior centers without having to drive 10 or 20 miles. Um, and I think that's where we need to look at putting the infrastructure in our county. I think um, the last decade or two, uh, you've seen a lot of growth in West County where Arundel Mills is and around Fort Meade. Um, that's happened. It's finishing up now. The Odenton Town Center is under construction and some other big developments over that way. Uh, in Annapolis, we've seen the Parole Center, which is right across the street, grow up. Um, and largely, we've been able to steer the development away from the General's Highway Corridor, Annapolis Neck, and other places. I'm not saying they didn't slip a couple things past the goalie, but for a large part, we've been able to protect against uh, a lot of sprawl development out that way. I think the development pressure is going to continue, and I think it's going to be up um, either unfortunately or fortunately, to the next county council to hold the line during the GDP and the comprehensive rezoning. And that's why it's so important, I'm not going to be around, that, that you elect good leaders that are going to think of their community first, you know, and maybe the, the developers second. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it's a great issue, Dick. I don't, I don't have the answer of what's the silver bullet to make sure that, that we grow the right way. But uh, I've always advocated a community-centric plan, either the, like the small area plans or something that has robust community input and process, and um, it needs to be strategic. And once you adopt the general development plan, the comprehensive rezoning should follow that and not have any wild cards that are coming in from uh, various council members. And that's part of the reason why I passed the, the um, charter amendment that would require any amendments that the council brings in to have public notice so they can't sneak anything past, you know? That's part of, that's, that's part of my Chris Trumauer Leave Things Better Than You Found It tour uh, 2018. So now that I realize I'm not going to be here next year, I'm trying to fix a couple things. Um, that's the reason why, and you know, maybe this isn't the most popular thing to talk about, but that's the reason why I introduced uh, and passed the legislation to increase the council salary. I mean, I'm never going to see any of that. But, uh, you know, I, 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 know how, I know how hard work this is and how much work it is. And I want to make sure that we're not disqualifying a certain segment of the population because they literally can't afford to be a county council member. So, uh, all right, we'll go to Ted. What do you got for us? World-renowned author, Ted Weber, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thanks for coming, first of all. So, Anne Arundel County has been doing a good job I'd say a great job doing stream restoration. Yeah. Um, but all that restoration can't compensate for bad development decisions. Um, one of those problems is that um, my understanding is that planning and zoning allows developers to build in the floodplains if you can build floodplains. And not only that, developers are allowed to claim 
only the current floodplain, but a historic floodplain, which means that the state is in size that they can't go back, like that area can't be put under easement, and they can't do stream restoration there and fix the broken stream. So that's a, a big problem. So those, the way that planning and zoning is treating our floodplains um, is uh, the, uh, making our restoration job. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's an interesting issue. I know that they recently, um, I think, adopted the new FEMA, the federal floodplain map, and so that had some changes. I'm not, I'm not familiar with all of the planning and zoning um, requirements along floodplains, but it, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's room for improvement. So if you want to follow up with me with some more specifics, I'd be happy to work on that with you. Okay, um, I'm very interested in... Uh, the state highways and, and the stormwater that comes off of yeah, them and yeah. how they're affecting the Jabez, which is yeah. the uh, headwaters of yeah. Severin. Um, we're getting, uh, from what I learned at the last meeting, we're a year and a half behind schedule on uh, fixing the Jabez. Yeah. Is there anything that you suggest that I or others can do to... Um, so, I mean, I'm aware of that project, and I was vocal getting it started. I'm disheartened to hear it so far behind. Uh, the state highways, they have their own municipal stormwater permit because they have literally so much surface area from all the highways um, that they have one that's separate from all the counties. Um, and they have been doing a lot of projects. If you drive up and down 97, you can see a couple on either side which is good. Um, as far as expediting that particular one, I mean, at this point, I would say probably the best bang for your buck is to reach out to um, Senator Ed Riley, who represents the area, and have him bug SHA. Um, I mean, senators have a lot of pull. You can reach out to the delegates as well, but, you know, senator is a little higher in the hierarchy. Um, However, I understand that most of this project is in Anne County. Is that right? That's what I've told, been told, yes. Good. So it's an SHA project that the county is contributing to? Exactly. There are okay. It's a subsidiary. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, be happy to, I'll be happy to yes. talk to our folks about that, too. Right. We need to get it back on track. I know. I know. All the nutrients and sediment that are going into the river is giving us a dead zone. Yeah. That's permanent. Not just part of the year, but all year round right. now. Well, year round, not permanent, because we're going to fix it, because we're cleaning it up little by little. Not, I'm not, I'm not prepared to admit that any, that any pollution is permanent. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't stop right. that. We'll well, go here, and then we'll go over here. I appreciate anything you could do. Absolutely. Okay. So I live in Annapolis Roads. Okay. We're dealing with huge, huge water runoffs from de from developers. Yep. I feel totally powerless, and I don't like to be there. Yeah. So my question is twofold. Uh, are there resources that we've got developers, they have all kinds of money, they have all kinds of lawyers, and they basically placate everything that happens. Are there resources, for example, at the University of Maryland, uh, I'm familiar with what uh, UP does up in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. that will help do uh, graduate student programs to help a, a so community like us you have the resources you know, yeah, let me introduce you to let me introduce you to Jackie Kill. Um, so Jackie is the head of the Chesapeake Legal Alliance. Jackie is fantastic, has built up that from basically a maybe a one person shop uh, to I don't know how many staff attorneys you have now, but but they have staff attorneys and they have a, a network of extremely impressive professional attorneys who do pro bono work specifically for communities and nonprofits that have environmental issues. Um, so talk to Jackie. There, also, there is a University of Maryland law clinic. Um, they, they probably get involved in a little bit different type of thing than specific community level things. But I, so I, I would say follow up with Jackie and her staff, but absolutely, I, I refer Jackie a lot of business. <laughs> Yeah, so great question, and um, look, I, that's on my jogging route, so I jog around the, the whole Annapolis Roads loop, and I see that, and um, that's why I've been very 
a frequent contactor of our inspections and permits to be on that site. So I know that there's a lot of contention about that project in general. It's happening for better or for worse, but they got to they gotta contain their site, absolutely. They got to do a better job. Yes, sir. Two years ago, uh, County Executive Shu in a presentation to the River Groups showed that the county's ability, its ability to borrow against the uh, stormwater fee will be exhausted by 2021. And in effect, we'll have completed about 45% of the projects required to meet the EPA requirements in 2025. Right. How should the county go about filling in the rest of its budget? So um, I occasionally get asked that question. And um, I'm, I'm not a fan of trying to raise our current fee structure. Because it was damn hard getting this to begin with. And I don't want to have that fight again. Um, I think that we are doing a lot of good with the resources we have. Could we do more good with more resources? Absolutely. Um, do I want to open up the rain tax debate again? Not particularly. So the good news is, and I will give the county executive, uh, I'll give Steve Shu some credit on this. The last two years, he's put additional general fund dollars into the stormwater dedicated fund. So what that means is those, those dollars are coming from the, from the general budget, but once they go into the dedicated fund, they're used the same way and, and they're accounted for the same way and they can't be taken out. So rather than talk about raising the fee, um, I think that there is potential to put more money in uh, as we see additional revenue in the county. Um, and then also, uh, Eric Michelson and his program have been doing some innovative things with their grant program and working, also bringing in some private financing dollars as well to leverage what they have. And um, we're also seeing, starting to see, I believe, some economies of scale as more and more jurisdictions are doing these projects and more and more businesses and, and firms are, are offering them. You're seeing the price come down, and you're seeing uh, you'd be able to do more with that cost. I call it the flat screen TV effect because I remember when flat screen TVs used to be, you know, thousands of dollars, and now they're, you know, they're a couple hundred bucks. You can get them at, at the Best Buy. So as technology advances and as the industry grows, I think we will be able to do more with less. Um, but there is always going to be a need to to try and get more than we have. That's the nature of government. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't. I don't think trying to raise the stormwater fee at this time um, is, is a good idea. Maybe sometime in the future with a different political climate and once these things are better accepted, that'll be on the table. If you look at the other major environmental funding source that's uh, statewide is the Bay Restoration Fee, which people call the flush tax. Um, that was in place. It was, I think, 25 bucks for a long time. They, a couple years ago, they increased that because they needed more um, revenue to finish the large wastewater treatment upgrade, uh, treatment plant upgrades. So, you know, once this has been in place for a while, maybe that'll be a conversation to get more revenue. But right now, I think we're doing really well with what we have, and there's some additional avenues to pursue uh, to leverage that more. Uh, we'll go Scott, and then we'll work our way back there. When you're talking about resources, and looking at Jesse Allen's the South River Keepers uh, report, um, 2014, I think it was 5% of environmental violations in Hanover County were actually enforced. Yeah, exactly. 2015. That, that's why Steve Lafferty and yeah. that bill. Yeah, and, and I, th I think that's great. And I think it's great that you're increasing, um, you're advocating for increased staffing when it comes to that. Do we have any idea of how much staffing we really need to get to actually get this to a, you know, a level? And then two, as far as the judiciary is concerned, um, it seems like the judiciary isn't enforcing this on, when it comes to civil fines. I mean, look, there's plenty of blame to go around. I mean, I've been to court cases. When I was the riverkeeper, I would get called to court cases, and I would go, and I would testify. I mean, I would say the county staff was so grateful that I would come. They're like, oh, my God, I can't believe we have someone to actually testify that they saw the people doing this stuff. I was like, yeah, happy to do it, you know? Like, they... they they are as frustrated as we are because their job is to try and enforce these things. And so if they bring a case to the court and then the guy, you know, the judge lets the violator off, they get deflated just like the advocates do. So I do think that there is an issue with the judiciary. I think it's probably, you know, this is the way it's always been done kind of thing. 
So um, maybe maybe there's a public awareness thing. Maybe there's a campaign that can be done to try and educate that. But um, I think from what I've seen, the inspectors themselves are almost as frustrated as we are. But but in general, your point is right. I mean, we've got single digit um, you know response rate to the violations. We need to do better. And and to me. That's, that's a big problem. The first step of that is getting more capacity for them to respond. And, and then when all of us start calling in these violations we see, uh, you know, we'll get a better response and ultimately, hopefully, better enforcement. Yes, sir. They are indexed, and, and so I, I would not call them environmental impact fees. Uh, they are adequate public facility fees. So these are um, for, like I said, roads and schools and public safety. So, but, they, but they are indexed. But that being said, um, I think it's, it's been almost 10 years. Uh, I think it's time to revisit that. And I would also say there's a big conversation going on in the county council right now about developer mitigation for school capacity. What we have, and this is very um, apparent in the Annapolis area, is we have a bunch of overcrowded schools, and what happens is when schools reach their capacity, development is closed, in quotation marks, closed, in quotation marks, closed for those school districts. And what that means is you can't do any major subdivisions. And so the developers, they don't like that because they want to do their subdivisions. Um, the schools don't like being over capacity, um, but the, the issue and per perhaps the opportunity I see is if there are true smart growth projects like mixed use projects that aren't going to result in a whole bunch of new students and they're in you know, the urban core or they're in the right area, you know, maybe there's a way to have those uh, go forward while they pay into some mitigation fund that can actually help the schools meet the capacity. I mean, we need to actually, instead of just having these disconnects, like you build X, you pay Y, you know, I mean, we actually need to get it to be an integrated approach to solve the problem. And as much as I love beating up developers, they're not the, they're not the chief problem of our overcapacity uh, recently. It's demographic changes. I mean, we've had a lot of folks come in um, that are having more kids and, and things turn over. So in Tyler Heights Elementary, which is like 130%, there's no new development there. What you have is a bunch of young families that have come in there, you know, and they're, they're generating a lot of more ch of students. So the development community bears a share of the responsibility, but I don't think it's quite fair to put it all on them. But what we should do is think about comprehensive solutions, working with the school system, the county, the development community, to find a way so that they're paying their true impact instead of just an arbitrary number that we came up with 10 years ago. Uh, Dick Ladd, Councilman Dick Ladd, ladies and gentlemen. May I ask a question? Yes, please. You spoke very eloquently earlier about looking at how well the, the development works on site. I would like to offer you a floor upon, look, oh, may, I ask, may I make an observation? That's my question. You can do whatever. The floor is yours, Council. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we've seen situations in the de development process where we go in now and the developer goes in and does the dirt work, and he uh, goes in and scrapes it all off, and then he starts subdividing it and sells it to various developers who come on. As soon as the dirt work is done, he is re his bond is released. Then the developers come in and they put the houses up and the county comes back and looks after the fact to see whether the stuff that's put in the roads, the drains, and the stormwater catchment bases, they work. But they only look at the work that was done at the end, not at the dirt work around the homes, which is where the retail level of the drainage is done. We've seen cases where they put it on the ground, they put it on the ground in places other than what the plan said. They put the houses in places with it slightly other than what the plan said. And nobody steps back and looks at the whole site plan to see if the stormwater runoff thing works as, as it should. Not necessarily how it's planned, but to look after the fact, first rain storm, does the thing got drained. So my suggestion is, like and this is done, the suggestion for what you see in Montgomery and Fairfax County is that you ask the developer, whoever it is, to put up a bond, just like we do when we do with grazing. You have to see that the vegetation 
stop abortion before he gets his bond back. We go back and look at the development one year after it's done and see that all the drainage and everything works as a system. We just thought the stuff rains into the streets and then down. And it's a slightly different thing because what happens, you want to make sure that when the water gets through, I mean, when, after the house is all up, all the air conditions are out and draining, down the power spikes are in place, and the utilities on the ground, whether the thing drains and functions as a system. We don't do that. And I submit to you that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. All I would say is you get, you get your deposit, performance bond, you put it in place, and then when the county looks to see whether everything drains right, then they get the money back. And we've had some horror stories on that over, over in Ireland. Deep Creek Village. Deep Creek Village. And as we get, as the, as the density goes up, as we grow, that becomes a bigger and bigger problem. My, my, my suggestion is we need to change when we look, step back and look and see that the thing is, is built right and it works at the end. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I mean, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of the cure. But I, 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 would, I would consider that also along the same lines as not, not allowing these, these projects to scrape the whole place and then lay barren for months or years before they put stuff in. But anybody know the place right at the end of Aris T. Allen on the right? I mean, they moonscaped that thing, what, three, four years ago? And they haven't done anything with it. It's just sitting there. Huh? Oh yeah, that's the yeah the town center. Yeah, well at least that's under construction. I don't know what they're doing with that Aris T. Allen one. Um, all right, let's go over to this side of the room. You guys have been quiet. What do we got over there in the back? I see leaving. I mean, I'm not leaving forever. I'm just not going to be in office. Still be around. So. So what, what I was, great question, by the way. Uh, what I will say is one of the reasons that I've been able to, I think, be successful on the council with environmental policy is because of a Tea Party Republican from Glen Burnie named John Grasso. John Grasso votes for the environment. He's awful on everything else like that, that, that progressive Democrats care about, but he is rock solid on the environment. Like, he gives me a run for my money. And so I'm in, the, I'm in the minority. I'm a Democrat in a majority Republican council with a Republican county executive. And I've been able to pass, we have been able to pass a lot of great environmental bills because John Grasso and before him, Dick Ladd, um, were, were on the council uh, voting for those things. Next year, you're going to have at least four new council members, maybe more, um, because four of us are term limited. So we're out. And then, you know, I'd say there's another race that's in flux, so it might be five. Um, and then I think there's two that are safely returning. Uh, so anyway, I think that there's a strong possibility that there's going to be a conservation majority. Um, what we need to make sure, what everyone needs to make sure, is that we have four good votes for the environment. And I don't care if they're Republican or Democrats right now. I just think my number one thing is if we don't get that, you can say bye-bye to the stormwater fee. Um, and then you can say bye-bye to all those restoration projects that are making the difference uh, to help clean up our uh, local waterways. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good candidates uh, out there. There's a couple in the room tonight. Uh, so certainly um, I would encourage you to reach out to people, uh, talk to them, see what their platforms on the environment are, and, uh, you know, hold them accountable. I mean, look, I got elected because of the environment. And then I got reelected too. So I think it's a winning strategy in Anne Arundel County. Uh, I think people care about it. <laughs> Brooksy. How are we going to stop that stadium that the county executive seems so strong? <laughs> so the Bayhawk Stadium, that. So I, I have this conspiracy theory about the Bayhawk Stadium <laughs> that it was literally like, they're, they're th it's like they're throwing that out almost to see what happens to it. Because the way that was rolled out was so bad, I can't imagine it was done. Yeah. Like, so, like, I'm actually not opposed to the general concept of doing something sports related there. But when I, you know, and I saw their plan and I met with the developers and we had a great meeting and they showed me, you know, the stadium and the fields and what they were going to do. And then they showed me the retail and the hotel. And I was like, guys, what are you, what are you doing? Um, but I mean, there, there's, 
there's a little bit of a good idea there. And, and I say that because what I would like to see happen there um, is I would like to see a public use that's compatible with the environment, that somehow honors the cultural and historical aspects of the site, and, and isn't out of sync with the community. And I think what we could do there, and um, if anybody saw the article um, by Jimmy DeButts in the Capitol a few weeks ago, he proposed this, which is hilarious because he, call, he called me up and he told me about his idea. I was like, Jimmy, I, 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 you're reading my mind. I had the same idea. I, I talked to the county exec about it last week. But I thought, let's not do an entire stadium and sports complex, but let's put a couple soccer fields on there for the clubs to play on. And let's do some passive recreation, some bike trails, some jogging trails. Let's connect it with Bacon Ridge Natural Area, which is my favorite place in the county. If no one's ever been there, please go there. It's awesome. Um, we have miles and miles of jogging and biking trails there. Uh, and then maybe let's, let's bring the um, Department of, of Recreation and Parks, who desperately needs a new headquarters, let's bring them up there so they can watch over the site uh, and give them an, a nice little facility. And there won't be major traffic concerns and we'll preserve most of the site and we'll honor the cultural history there and we'll have you know, some, some maybe we'll, we'll keep some of the existing buildings as a museum or something. But that's something that all Anne Arundel County residents can enjoy. It's something that won't uh, throw the, the General's Highway community out of whack. Um, the thing about the Bayhawks plan they're not, I mean, it's going to take years to do that 97 connection. I mean, that, anything with, this, with an interstate highway is going to take forever. Um, I don't know where all the money would come from. And um, I think it would cause uh, some real problems with the community. And uh, so, you know, we'll see what happens. Right now, I can tell you for a fact that the state under the Maryland Stadium Authority is, per, is pursuing a study. They're looking at various um, feasibility th issues and I think that's supposed to be done in six months or so. Um, but you've seen, I think initially the county executive was a little bit gung-ho about it. You've seen him now walk back. I think he saw the opposition in the community. And for my part, it just, th that plan doesn't seem viable. So uh, I think the community should be vigilant. I also, I don't see anything happening anytime soon. And I would like to continue the conversation to have something be there that is um, accessible to all county residents, that provides a public benefit, and that's environmentally sound. So that's what I hope happens there. I think we'll be talking about that for years to come. What else you got? All the way in the back. Great. What do you mean lately? When did you when did you move back here? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, I'm wondering, is there any plan to address that particular issue? I was going to ask about the crabby population. You're talking about the Chesapeake Bay blue crabs? Yeah, I mean, the Severn River. I bet you the Severn Well, they're a lot better in the Severn than in other places because the Severn actually has some bay grasses. I mean, that's. Getting yeah, it's, it's getting better, yeah. Um, so, okay, so the bridge. Uh, the best of my knowledge, they're putting another lane on that somehow, which is a little bit bamboozling to me, but there's construction that's ongoing, and I've been told they're adding a lane. I think that will require them making all the other lanes more narrow. Uh, they, already, they already cantilevered the thing once, so I don't understand how they can cantilever it more. Um, they're not, okay. So, yeah, but even, so that, has been that the Severn River Bridge has been a traffic bottleneck for as long as I've been in Annapolis, which has been 10, 15 years. Um, it's gotten worse over recent years. I guess more people are traveling to the Eastern Shore or something. Um, but uh, I don't know. They'll probably add a lane. It'll still be bad. Um, the bigger conversation is what are they going to do with the Chesapeake Bay Bridge? Are they going to put another span there? So, you know, those are big picture issues that I think the state and our county are gonna be wrestling with for years. Um, I actually don't think that they should do anything with the Bay Bridge, except make sure it's safe, you know. Um, Cause I think that's a natural limiting factor. The minute that you open up another span, the, the Eastern Shore is just gonna become, you know, completely 
uh, another suburban county. And I grew up in Chestertown, and I like the Eastern Shore the way it is. I think we should keep it that way. So uh, that's my personal opinion, but I don't know. What else we got? Uh, Pat. Yeah, no argument for me there. Secondly, mitigation plans that we work on where developers go into a property clear cut or cut trees and foliage down with impunity, with no permit, and when caught finally after maybe three violations, they are assigned a mitigation plan that includes, say, a four to one replacement and planting, but they are planting trees in Glen Burnie for decimation, say, on Whitehall Creek. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. They should replant right where their violations are. Can you talk about that? Well, um the, the mitigation is a big problem across the county. Uh, sometimes when developers uh, claim that they can't replant trees, they don't plant them anywhere. They do what's called fee in lieu, uh, which means they just pay into a fund. Well, that's designed then, that fund is designed to plant trees all across the county. The problem is money has accumulated in that fund. We now have $7 million sitting in that fund because we can't find places, we can't find public property to plant trees on. So uh, I view that as a political liability where you've got all this money sitting there that's supposed to be doing an environmental service that isn't, isn't working. Um, and I think that we need to look at that, uh, that fund. I think we need to do some, some big picture things. Like let's, let's talk about using some of that for acquisition. If we don't have the places to plant the tree, let's acquire some and let's plant them. But also, you could, you could plant a lot of trees for seven million bucks in Crownsville, you know, on that center. I'm just saying. Bonnie. Yeah. It's way better than yep. Yeah. Yeah, but more like we should use that fund for environmental benefit in some way, whether it's preserving your mature forests, uh, you know, acquiring new land, take it out of development, and put it into uh, you know forest cover. That's what we need to do with it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, why? The, uh, I, I was talking before about her, the, the impact fees. Yeah. That is essentially an impact fee. The fee in lieu should be sufficient to cover not just planting a tree in the existing land, but acquiring the land to plant the tree in. Sure. So the fee in lieu really needs to be approximately, what, quadruple, quintuple, maybe 10? I mean, but it needs to cover the land as well as the tree. And it doesn't come close to that right now. It's a joke. Yeah, I'm all for raising the fee and loan uh, requirements. Ms. Johnson, good to see you. Um, my personal, one of my many personal problems was the BGE came in last September and cut a number of my trees in yeah. half horizontally. And then they cut these others in half vertically. They took a couple of others down to the ground. Um, it turns out that they have no easement to have any holes and fires and stuff on my property. But when they were dropping things down, they mangled my uh, gate and my, my, and my fence. And they said, well, it was like that when we got here. Mm -hmm. And um, so they do nothing. And in my tears and, you know, pleas to other people, you know, have you heard of anything like this and what can be done? And they go, oh, where do you hear my score? You should have seen what they did. I used to live in Broadnack. I had one beautiful 16-year-old shade tree in my yard. I came home from work, and there was nothing. So after many battles, they planted one little sapling. And but I hear this from all over, Chris. I hear people you know, telling me, and I, I, there's some people who are really experienced and really committed. They say, you know. 
BGE can do anything and there's no stopping them. There is nothing to hold them accountable. So my question to you on behalf of people like me, because my treaties were been the mature. They are sort of the low. No, but I have I don't have that much land, but it's a little piece of the urban forest. No, and you probably, most of you know that a mature tree So your question is, what do we do about BG, yeah. essentially? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I think we've probably all seen the, the results of some of their tree trimmings. Um, when you talk to BGE about it, what they like to say is, well, sure, but you know, after a storm and when the trees fall on the wires, everyone wants us to cut more stuff. I actually, I don't know what the regulations are regarding the right of way with the utilities and what they're allowed to do. Um, we get a lot of, I get a lot of constituent referrals. Some folks want, want me to contact BGE to trim the trees. Some folks are upset because BGE did trim the trees. Uh, they've generally been responsive to me. Uh, I, j I don't have the familiarity of what the regulations are for their right of way to, you know, to comment. For you, we're doing a 20-year pruning plan. That's why we're taking down. And of course, they didn't know the findings the day they were coming. They were supposed to, but they just sort of forgot it. So they did as much as they could before. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not above the law, so if they did something inappropriate, um, but they should be. The point. I don't know if there's anybody else here who has a problem. If you talk to me, maybe we can sort of do something. Yeah. How are we doing on time, Tom? How much longer do you guys want to hear from me? Are you bored yet? I don't even know. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Um, did you already have one? We'll go over here. So just a, it's a quick related question. Uh, a, a couple weeks ago, there were county trucks out cutting trees all along the road. And some actually went down some private roads and, and cut trees. They were marked with the county seal? They were. Huh. So I, I, and I had never seen that. Before. Yeah, I was. So I wonder why they would be trimming trees <coughs> along roads. Yeah, I, I don't know. If uh, if you want to send me an email with the exact location, I'll follow up and figure out what they were doing. But that that sounds unusual to me. Usually, you see county trucks that you know are servicing the sewer pumping stations or with road, you know snow plows on them. But tree trimmers, that's that's an unusual one. All right, last call. You guys got anything else for me? Bob, you want to raise your hand. There you go. Well, coming back to Crownsville. Yeah. You, you talked as if the county might have some control over it. I, I wonder how you see the property transitioning. Can we hold the state responsible? Can well, we about the cleanup? And can we get control over it so we have some say about it? So I advocated for the county to take control. And there was a task force a couple years ago. I was on it. You might have been on it. No? I read it. Okay, you read it. So anyway, um, the trivia is the Department of Health, the Maryland Department of Health owns the property of all, of all people. And at this task force meeting, the, um, the secretary of the Department of Health said, we will give this property away to the county for a dollar. And I wrote a very nice letter to the county executive at the time, and I said, I think you should take him up on this offer. I know that there's a lot that would have to happen and there's remediation and there's a bunch of problems, but this is, I don't know how many hundreds of acres, it's right in the middle of the county, like let's take it on. Like the, it's, it's a big challenge, but it's a big opportunity. And then we would control the destiny of that instead of like you said, uh, being secondary to the state. So, you know, for, for valid reasons, the county executive decided uh, he did not want to take over that liability. But, but as you say, the state could decide if they wanted to, to surplus that. And um, you know, it could go into private holding. It could do a number of things. The one thing that the county has control over is the zoning. Right now, the zoning on that is mostly open space and rural, uh, low density. So um, you know, like one house per 20 acre kind of stuff. So if there was going to be any major development besides a bunch of 20 acre mansion sites, they would need to go through rezoning and that has to go through the county council. Um, but if the state wants to use an institutional use, 
they are not bound by the zoning. So if they wanted to do something that they made a case that this was, you know, in the business of the state, then they can not necessarily do whatever they want, but they have a pretty wide leeway. So that to me is uh, concerning. Um, they could make a case that they want to use the highest and, and best use of the property and maximize their resource. Um, state's always looking for money. Well, they'd have to get a whole nother level of approval for a casino. Um, you know, I, I, don't think, I don't think that the state is going to do that. Um, I think they view the site as a headache and they want to get rid of it in a way that's not going to create a bigger headache for them. Um, but we just don't know. And we also, you know, politic politics changes. We, we don't know what this governor is, wants to do versus whether he gets reelected or whether there's a new governor. Um, we haven't heard a whole lot about what County Executive Shu envisions happening with that property other than, you know, his initial interest in the sports complex. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I would, I would, for one, like the county to take control of it because I think that then we have a vested incentive to make sure that it is a good use uh, for our residents. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a big part of our county. Last yeah, Chris, what, what happened to the plan that was a, a combination of nonprofit campuses and some, some commercial like office space that would help fund that? Yeah, I mean, there's, so there's the, the, yeah, the community complex of Crownsville or whatever their acronym was, they had a concept plan and a business plan uh, that would basically utilize a lot of the existing sites and maybe attract some other anchor institutions that would be like a nonprofit campus. And I think everybody loved that idea. I love that idea. But, you know, the financing of making that happen was probably pretty daunting. And I think it probably didn't come together. Um, I mean, that's my best guess. But I would still like to see some passive recreation use coupled with maybe keeping a couple nonprofits around in the facilities that are um, appropriate to do that. I mean, we have the food bank there. We have uh, a couple of behavioral health providers there, uh, Godenzia and the Pascal Center. Um, so there are some good groups that, that could continue to exist there, but they only need a very small part of that. And I think there's a lot of dilapidated buildings. There's a lot of um, hazards that, frankly, could be bulldozed and just let it turn into a meadow, you know? It's, uh, a, it's a sewer system that they have built there that is a liability on how you hook up. Yeah, there's a spray field sewer system. And so and it's a, so if, if they want to do any major development there, they're going to have to either bring water and sewer up or they're going to have to upgrade to some sort of minor, uh, modern minor septic or uh, sewer system. So, and then the other, you know, there's also, there's all these, uh, old asbestos pipes and everything buried. If you just leave them underground and you, you know you want to put a soccer field over it, it doesn't matter. They're not going anywhere. But if you're digging stuff up and you're developing it, you're going to have to worry about all that stuff. So it's a lot. There's one more in the back. Do you, one in the back. All right, last. This is it. You get the last one. It's been great having your perspective and voice and experience on the council. Sure. I'm just wondering what you're going to do next and when we can vote for you again. <laughs> Um, thank you. So, what what a softball question to end the night. Um, but uh, I've I'm very proud of the the seven and a half years and soon to be eight years that I've had on the council. Literally, you know, I got into this and I ran and I thought I'm going to pass a bunch of environmental stuff and get voted out of office and run out of town. Um, and then I got reelected and somehow along the way I turned into a budget wonk. And so I don't, you know, it's all weird. I mean, I have a chemistry degree. I don't even know what I'm doing here. But um, right now, I'm just going to run for husband and father and uh, try and do a good job on that for four years. And uh, I'm going to stay involved in government. I mean, I'm not sure what my role might be. Uh, I'm having a good time talking with Mayor Gavin and giving him advice when he wants it and helping him. He's an exciting dude, <laughs> uh, like, like Gavin. Um, I'm, you know, probably going to be around to come to county council meetings and, and testify and, and tell my former colleagues and some new colleagues what I think they should do and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe have some other role in state government or somewhere else too. Uh, 
you know, I worked for DNR for nine years and I could see myself ending up back there someday, but I want to keep doing a good job wherever some place will have me. Uh, but somehow I also need to earn a living and pay my rent. So, you know, it's a challenge around here, but uh, thank you for the question. And I don't think you guys have seen the last of me regardless. Thanks, you guys. You've been great.